this week is about customer centricity. Um, that is not a simple word. Um, a customer centric organization is one that pledges everything that it does for the benefit of the customer. It's an organization that has the customer uh, in its veins, um, in its lungs, and uh, in its soul. Um, and that needs to be verified from the point of view of uh, building a vision with the customer at the heart of it, um, crafting strategies that will deliver value to the customers, putting building blocks of processes and systems and procedures that really are focused on the customer and delivering outcomes at the other end which are meant to satisfy the customer first and then bring revenue and bring profit and bring benefits to the organization itself. So it's not a simple thing. Um, a customer-centric organization is not just one that throws something in the air and hopes that the customer will catch it, goes on his or her knees and say, thank you for giving me a wonderful product. That is not uh, the approach, as we will see through the presentation. So in a sense, we have reverted basically the game power. And customer centricity means that it's the customer who drives, uh, not, um, not the organization. We talk about um, uh, the putting the customer in the driving seat. Um, mm -hmm. And um, while well, technology is being sorted out, I can continue to talk. Putting the customer in the driving seat, it is the customer who decides what to do, and it is the customer who really chooses for him or herself. In a sense, we are talking here about uh, the customer is king. I remember years ago when this expression came out, there was a lot of... Uh, mixed reactions. Um, some organizations defended themselves by saying, well, how can the customer be king? We are the ones who really build what they need. We are the ones who educate the customer. We are the ones who work day and night to give them value. And the customer is the recipient. He is a passive uh, contributor to the value chain. So the customer cannot be king. Now, some other people recognize that the customer is important downstream in the value chain, but they never said that the customer is king. Here we're saying the customer is king. Why? Because the customer views us from a different angle now. The value chain, if you start at the one-stop one shop, with the internet, for example, with the e-commerce, you click and you enter the organization. You can identify how good the supply chain is. You can look at the options the organization puts in front of you. You can mix and match according to your requirements. And you can decide what price and what value mix you want to get. And then you can get out without shopping. There is no salespeople harassing you and trying to force you into an option or making a decision. You are the true king. You know, and you can decide. So in a sense, yes, we have entered an era where the customer is king. The other thing that... Um, uh, needs to be borne in mind is the everything, the holistic perspective. The customer does not just want price options. They want value for many options. What does that mean? It means perhaps convenience. It means speed. It means quality. It means dependability. And then maybe price can come down the list. But they will decide on the list of attributes and the list of requirements and the list of conditions for doing the transaction with the organization. And you cannot just force a customer to buy from you just because the price is right. You cannot force a customer to buy from you because you have superior quality. Because quality is a relative statement. You know, to some, quality means speed. To others, quality means functionality. And to others is uh, the service, the dependability. So we all define quality according to our requirements. And by the way, those requirements change with time. Today I want to fly. I want to fly at midnight. The options might close for me and may I may find two alternatives. So I have to compromise my definition and my description of what quality is. Because availability of the flights become number one. Some other time, if I am going to fly and, and enjoy the flight and I'm going on holiday, so the, the, maybe the, the quality of the airline, the quality of the service, the time the flight uh, takes off, 
they become priorities. So we reorganize, we reprioritize, and we decide basically what is wanted from us. The one-to-one -one is really about this customization. I'll come to that in a minute because it's a very interesting concept. It means there is a direct dialogue. There is no intermediary. You buy a computer now, you buy it from the OEM. You buy a car, you buy it from the OEM. The middle people have, uh, have seen their days off now. You, know? you don't have to have translators. The voice of the customer is converted directly. And we're a global village. You don't know where you're buying from. You don't know who is talking to you at the end of the line. When you click and enter a website to do an e-transaction, you don't know where you're clicking. You know, whether the hub is in London, whether it's in Canada, whether it's in the Middle East, you don't know, because we're a global village. And I think this interactability, this replenishment of needs of the customer is an ongoing thing. Because when you think about it, everything we buy in life is a commodity product. We live in an era where we're shrinking uh, the uh, life cycle of products or services, and unless the organizations can replenish and they can give the customer something new, something different, or, or the same thing again quickly, uh, then we are in trouble. You see, replenishment through innovation is, is a key thing. The cars look at 20 years ago, the, 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 the cycle uh, of development you know, was 10 years. Now you can put a brand new car together in less than 12 months. The computers uh, 15 years ago would take four years, five years to develop a new model. Now in a matter of four weeks or five weeks, you have new brands coming out, et cetera, et cetera. The pace has increased, the multi uh, multiplicity of offering has increased, and the replenishment requirement therefore has increased because we get bored very quickly. You buy a car after 18 months, something else comes, uh, and then you get bored and you want to change it, provided the value is there. So the customer is really at the driving seat, and we must recognize that. So when it comes to understanding what that uh, means, I remember we used to teach customization. That was uh, a revealing concept, mass customization. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we produced 12 million computers, but then we we basically break that volume into economies of scope by identifying segments of the market where we can create differentiation by focusing on those segments. That was a revealing, um, uh, if you like, era, uh, which revolutionized um, mass into custom customization. And then we even zoomed in and said, would it be nice if for the 12 million uh, customers that we sell to, we have basically one-to-one -one relationships. We profile the customers. And it is happening, isn't it, with CRM, with customer relationship management, with software, with loyalty cards. You know, the retail sector is doing it. The banking industry is doing it. The airline industry is doing it. The hospitality industry, the hotels is doing it. So we have created basically one-to-one -one relationships between the customer and the providers, the suppliers of everything, you name it, everything. Amazon, for example, they, they have my profile. They warn me about new books coming out, which they may think might be of interest to me. They tell me that the books I was searching for last time, which were not available, are now available. They also tell me, by the way, some of the books are on offer here. You may save yourself 50% discount. So they have found a way, a mechanism for creating a dialogue with me on a regular basis, on a going, uh, ongoing basis. Now, I want to introduce a new concept. Maybe that word, you will not find it in the dictionary, customerization. I think the holistic perspective in the 21st century is that customization talks about, if you like, creating variations, offerings based on a product range or on a service range by doing the 2080 rule. You know, uh, basically by saying to you, 80% is the same across the board, but we can give you exactly what you want on the 20% extra. You can buy a car while they are producing them in mass. You can say, I want my car, the paint to be pink. I want my tires to be bigger. I want to have more optionality in the, uh, in, in the inside the car. 
you know, and you can actually select various things. So by the time the car comes out, nobody else has got that car except yourself. So this is, if you like, a transaction based on a product or service. But I am talking about the new concept, which is customerization, which means that the customer builds the system right from the beginning. The customer drives the value chain. This is very significant, what I'm sharing with you tonight. And you see it. For example, uh, you go to IKEA, they will say to you, bring the dimensions of your kitchen and sit at the driving seat and you can design your own kitchen from the beginning. You can choose the materials. You can choose the colors. You can choose the dimensions. You can choose the method by which your kitchen is built. And you can actually drive the value chain until the delivery. When you want it to be delivered, how you want it to be delivered, how much you want to pay for it, what quality you want to get, that is putting the customer at the driving seat. Now, this means that we have moved from product service to actually uh, uh, the customer as a person, the customer uh, as a decision maker in that process. So, it brings me to a concept that I call value of the king, or value is king. In, 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 in a sense, what we are saying is that value is uh, uh, perceived by the customer uh, and, and, and that will never change. We say beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. It must be consistent and it must be accurate. In other words, uh, the customer has a perception of us. The customer has a perception of what they want. And that is precise. You cannot fiddle with it. Because if you provide value to the customer, you have to really go back to the fundamentals and say, we give you precisely what you want. We don't try to fool you with good sales pitch and, you know, and mesmerize you with some marketing campaign uh, that tickles you and elevates you in 10,000 feet. But when you land, you, you think you've made a mistake. That's not exactly what you want. Customization means you are building your own needs. And a customer-centric organization is one that allows you to fiddle that allows you to build precisely what you want. It's happening in many industries. For example, the airline, if you're lucky to travel first class or business class in some of the airlines, you can even design your own menu. If you are on a long haul flight, you know, going to New Zealand or Australia, you can, you can say, this is what I want for my breakfast. This is what I want for my lunch. This is what I want for my dinner. These are the ingredients that I want. I have an allergy, so I don't want this. And you know what? They prepare your own menu. So when you board the flight, they welcome you and they give you your own menu. And they serve you exactly what you want. Pre I said precise. It has to be accurate and it has to be consistent. It's important for people. Some customers have allergies, you know, using pillows. So the hotel, you tell them precisely what, how your room should be set for you. And they prepare your room according to what you want. So it is happening. I mean, I can give you thousands of examples on this. But it's a wonderful concept because for the first time, we have put the customer in the driving seat. And thanks to technology and the internet particularly, uh, we have been able to do so. So the value chain concept, the supply chain concept, has been re-engineered de facto because technology or the internet makes uh, us as an organization transparent. It makes the customer see us precisely and they know uh, basically how uh, to manipulate us. So the value is doing the right thing for the right person every day, all the time. That's what customer centricity is. The right thing means the recipe of success of that organization depends on its ability to let the customer decide what they want and helping the customer achieve what they want. For the right person means personalization or customization, what is for me may be different from you, okay? You, you, you can sit on a plane, you know, you're eating your meal, it's delicious, my meal is different, and we both paid first class seats. You may have your in-flight entertainment uploaded completely different from mine because yours, you want, you want basically to, to have something educational, you, might, you want to listen to the news. Um, and, you know, you want probably to watch a football game 
uh, the person next to you, they may want to be entertained with movies one after the other, you know, because it's a long flight or whatever. The technology is enabling us to do this. The cabins for the, uh, and tonight, by the way, I'm going to talk a lot about the aircraft industry. That is what is happening. It's for me only. This is the mentality. This is the slogan. For me only. And when you have millions and millions of customers and you introduce the for me only uh, philosophy, then it's a wonderful concept. So value has to be personal. It has to be cherished as a personal thing. It has to be judged and seen by customers. It has to be one customer is different from the other one. So please bear that in mind when somebody asks you about what is really um, customer centricity. All compromise is based on, uh, this is a, a famous quote from uh, the great uh, Mahatma Gandhi. He said, all compromise is based on give and take. Okay? But there can be no give and take on fundamentals. Any compromise on mere fundamentals is a surrender. For it is all give and no take. That's why we have to be precise. You know, if I have a food allergy and you know, I have a long flight and I precisely ask for a menu, but you give me something different, I cannot accept it. It's all give and no take because the customer asks for a particular reason. You see? So that is, that is what we're talking about. It's precise, accurate, the promise, delivering the promise to the customer. And if we don't know the customer, uh, Gandhi describes the customer very well for us. He says the customer is the most important visitor on our premises. Obviously, this is before the days of the internet. He's not dependent on us. We all depend on the customer. He's not an interruption to our work. He's the purpose of it. He's not an outsider on our business. He's part of it. We are not doing him a favor by serving him. He's doing us a favor by giving us an opportunity to do so. So that's what the customer is, and that will not change. The customer is king, he's in the driving seat. Technology has given a weapon to the customer. He can decide, he can switch. Nowadays, you can switch your bank account in minutes. Your data is transferred automatically. You can switch airlines, you can switch hotels, you can switch even in education. I used to say, learning is essential, universities are not, because the days of the brick and mortar are you know, counted. So the learner now is, is really a self-service method. You guys learn by yourselves. The best we can do is mentor you, guide you, and support your learning journeys. So unless we can wake up to that fact and you know, we provide you with a blackboard, we provide you with the ability to access the library remotely um, and have a, a blended strategy for learning, then you will switch to somewhere else because you know, it's more convenient for you. Because your customer is king. The learner is king. And that is what quality is all about. It's about acknowledging that who has got the power, who is in the driving seat. And it is no longer a push mentality. It's a pull mentality. OK? So let me now talk about, really, on the ground, what is happening. And I want to spend a lot of time talking about the airline. You know, the airline is a fascinating industry but it's an industry which is in a mess. Because for so long, the airline has been promising us wonderful experiences and promising us the wow factor. But the reality is the airline always falls short. Because if you look at um, uh, what is happening around the world now, um, the airline is more concerned with squeezing costs and inconveniencing passengers. And I will, I will tell you in a bit uh, why is that. So, Let's go back to judge the airline, to, to, go back to what elementary service quality used to mean. You know, having a seat on the aircraft, basically making sure your booking is done properly, making sure you don't miss your connecting flight, making sure your baggage arrived on time. We know what the fiasco with Terminal 5. So this, these are fundamentals. If they do it, we will applaud them. We will say, thank you, you've done a great job. That was 30 years ago. When we used to preach about service quality, when we used to talk about the seven, eight dimensions of quality, when we used to talk about the Kano model, I mean, all of these concepts, we thought they were dead. But believe me, they're not dead yet. I mean, look at how people describe the airline. This is years ago. 
Captain Eddie Rickenberg of Eastern Airlines used to call it bombs on seats. Fill the aircraft, fill the cabin, make sure it flies all the time, carrying bombs on seats, okay? You think that has changed? Well, he is a guy, O'Leary, has anybody f flown with Ryanair? Okay, it's still bombs on seats. <laughs> he said the air transport is just a glorified bus operation. Isn't that an insult to us as customers? Isn't that really an arrogant attitude that doesn't believe in customer centricity? But that's what he said. Ha, unless you are Mr. Bush Senior. He says, the thing I miss about Air Force One is they don't lose my luggage. Well, tough, you know, you left the White House, so you have to queue up like everybody else and hope your luggage arrived on time. Lord King, when he was uh, uh, involved in privatization of British Airways, he said, Oh, there seemed to be an advantage of not knowing too much about the business, he said uh, to, uh, to Fortune magazine when they interviewed him. In my ignorance, I could do things I might not have done if I had been better informed. Well, I'm not sure he's done a good job, to be honest, looking at British Airways. Um, and then his famous quote at the time was that we are not flying aircraft, we are carrying people safely to their desired destination and in a profitable way to them and to us. You tell me if you have flown British Airways recently, whether they have been profitable to you as well. And he is a guy who is emotional, you know, he falls in love with uh, airplanes. Uh, the ex-chairman of um, uh, Southwest, Southwest are a low-cost airline, and, you know, basically they are one of the most quoted examples. He said, the company is stronger if it is bound by love rather than by fear. You know, you tell me when you're losing money whether love can still persist. So it's nice to hear what these people are saying. Mr. Ford used to say a business that makes nothing but money is a poor kind of business. Look at what happened to Ford. You know, now they don't want customers, they want to save their skin, they want money. Bill Gates said if you can't make it good, at least make it look good. Okay, right? Cheat. You, you know, this is it, isn't it? I mean, the customer-centric mentality is that when things are going well, we all speak the romantic language. But it's nice to judge whether the integrity of a business, the ethics of a business are there when things are tough, you know, and th they all change. Ed Aker, chairman of Air Florida said, once you get hooked on the airline business, it's worse than dope. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> so if these people are you know, hooked on the airline business, why don't they make it better? You know, they don't want to get out of it, but they don't want to make it better. I'm a, I'm a bit surprised. Um, President of American Airlines in the 30s, 80, 40s, 60s, said these days no one can make money on the goddamn airline business. <laughs> the economics represent sheer hell. At least he was honest to tell us it's difficult to make money with the airline. This is the 60s, right? But I, this is my favorite. This guy actually said it. A recession is when you have to tighten your belt, okay? Make sure you tighten your belt. A depression is when you have no belt to tighten. Oh my God. When you have lost your trousers, you know the airline business is yours. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Terminal 5. And he is a guy who thought he was flying, and he did fly. Sir Freddie Laker, on the 3rd of February 1982, said, I am flying high and couldn't be more confident about the future. And then, Freddie Laker, you know, the Laker Airways disappeared from the face of Earth. Customer centricity, wow. Oh, this is politics now. Chairman of Air France, 1996. It is obvious uh, we are fighting for the Air France group, but in actual fact, we are also fighting for France. Da, 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 da. Customer centricity, you see? This is really the story of the airline. Oh, he's a guy who likes to play with toys. In the 80s, my gut feeling was that airlines were crap. I hated spending time on planes. I thought we could create the kind of airline I'd like. So we got a second, a second hand 747 and gave it a go. Play, see, customer centricity. So, so the bottom line is this, you see. When you are stranded at Terminal 5, your bags are lost, your connections are lost. Some people, you know, had doctor's appointments, you know. Some people were in wheelchairs. Some people had babies with them, families. 
Some people had weddings lined up and they traveled all the way from New Zealand and Australia to attend their daughter's wedding or their son's wedding or whatever. When you are in this mess, okay, you will know what customer centricity is all about because this is an ugly um, manifestation uh, of uh, to you basically to witness it in the 21st century and this is where you see total chaos, total failure. You know, bags being lost, flights diverted, flights cancelled, you know, and the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. All of a sudden we're all blinded by confusion and uh, uh, the crisis has taken over and you stop a person to talk to and they just want to hide, you know, they, they, they don't want to face you. Uh, the big bosses are not there, of course, you know, and I feel sorry for the people at the front because they are the ones facing the music. It hasn't improved, right? Two days ago, I was at Terminal 5, and it wasn't better. It was still a crisis. So, let's go back now. 2006, the top 100 brands in the world are these, these pictures. I'm going to show you all of them. Just see if you see an airline there, right? This is one. This is another one. This is another one. This is another one. Where's the airline? Not in the top 100 global brands. Why? Why is that? Wonder. The airline industry is romantic. People love to see aircraft. People love flying. The real experience that we feel it, the emotional fulfillment, that an, an industry could give us near enough is the airline. It's different than going to a hotel. It's different to, than going to a restaurant. It's different than riding a car. The airline is so special. It's romantic. That's why those guys can't get out of this industry. It's, you know, they're, they're, they're foolish, but they're obsessed with the industry. It's, it's a fascinating industry. So it's like love, love hate. So, the reason that none of the world's airlines are in the top 100 global brands is because they're not good enough to be there. It's because they're inconsistent with the way they deal with customers. It's the way be, be, because they haven't got hold of the core aspects of customer requirements and customer centricity. I remember using these attributes to look at service quality in the airline over 20 years ago. And I just want you to read this list of things. Look at the top. No lost baggage. And guess what? Terminal 5, April 2008, millions of bags are being lost. I was reading on the newspaper when I was coming here uh, yesterday. Uh, one of the models, Kate Moss, I think, you know, she landed in Los Angeles and she had something like 10 bags, uh, Louis Vuitton, you know, kind of thing, lost. And she was going to put a claim for 10,000 pounds, you know, lost bags. So this is a crisis, 2000. No damaged baggage, clean toilets, courteous fa uh, cabin crew, you'll be lucky. A clean cabin, you'll be lucky. Comfortable temperature, wow. Take a bottle of oxygen with you next time. Being kept informed of delays, <laughs> you'll be lucky. On time arrival, keep hoping. Availability of blankets and pillows, Ooh, cost cutting, remember? <laughs> Those were the days before, sir, you know, we don't give them anymore. Safety, let's keep hoping. Do a little prayer when you board the plane. Here's some more. On time temperature, comfortable seats. You'll be lucky if you don't have, uh, you know, a major operation when you land. Prompt baggage delivery, no chance. Ample leg room, pay for it, sir. First class only. Good quality meals. Depends how hungry you are. <laughs> Prompt reservation service. Mm -hmm. Assistance with connections. You go to Heathrow and find somebody who can direct you. You know? Uh, and so on and so forth. In other words, these kind of expectations, customer attributes, the drivers of customer satisfaction, 30 years ago, 
they haven't been fulfilled. And that's why the airline industry, none of them are worthy of being in the top 100 global brands. That is really the bottom line. They're not good enough. These are the basics. This is really their license to practice. That's what they should be doing without, uh, if you like, any interruption, any blips. The confidence of the customer in you delivering their bags is important. The, the confidence of the customer reaching their destination on time is very important. The comfort of the customer is what they pay for. You are in a cabin. The cabin is a limited space. You know, we have gone back many years ago to those quotes I showed you, which are about carrying, you know, bums on seats, a glorified bus transfer kind of industry. You know, that's the reality. So, I remember in 1992, Sir Valence, who was then the ex -chairman, of, uh, chairman of BT at the time, he said, the day we stop receiving customer complaints is the day I will start to worry about the future of British Telecom. A listening organization, a caring organization, a customer-centric organization. Is that true? Well, not really, because if you look at uh, some of these studies, that have demonstrated what sustains customer attachment is the experience. So this CEM thing, I'm not going to say much about it tonight, but it's important for you to understand, is the, uh, the, the experience that gets the customer to judge for themselves. It's not the empty promise that they, you know, uh, somebody else gives them. And it is not, if you like, the deceitful attitudes and the deceitful basically way of selling and marketing that organizations give us. This is us judging for ourselves. And it shows that the more experiential uh, uh, opportunity we give to the customer, the more attachment they are to our business. The average business performance grows as the customer experience management score grows. That tells us something. If British Airways are consistent with the way they treat us, from A to Z, with basically confident that their promise is, re is re realizable, the more they benefit profitably. Why should you switch if you are benefiting? It doesn't make sense. Loyalty has to be earned. Loyalty is not, if you like, a concept that floats in the air and then you hope that it will come down uh, in abundance for you. It has to be earned, and it's hard work. The reason we didn't talk about that loyalty a few years ago is because we didn't know how to measure it. We didn't know how to evaluate it. Most organizations in the public and the private sector, they extrapolate. They say, we measure customer satisfaction, and every year our customer satisfaction rating has been going up. Okay? So now we average something like 92%. Because of the, therefore, extrapolation. Uh, we have loyalty increasing as well. Rubbish. Customer satisfaction is an absolute measure. It's a snapshot. Today I am happy, but it doesn't mean tomorrow I'm going to be happy because it depends on your ability to renew the same experience for me. And if you continue to do it reliably and for me only, then there is no reason for me to switch. Then loyalty becomes real. So loyalty is hard to be earned. As soon as you blip, you lose the loyalty. It's like a marriage. You see, loyalty is depends on faithfulness. Faith, uh, maybe I shouldn't have brought this subject. But that is, that is reality. Customers switch, and they do switch when they are angry. You know, uh, a lifetime relationship can be abandoned uh, because you've let them down in a big way once. And a lot of people, I guess, will never fly British Airways again because of the fiasco in Terminal 5. So if you look at why the, the inconsistency in the airline and other businesses exist, it's because we don't have the value chain defined in terms of the true requirements of customer centricity. Business processes are not designed to deliver the experience. You build brick and mortar. You isolate operations, the, the experienced staff, uh, and, and you basically keep me away from the ability for me to influence what I want, and you expect me to have an experience, that doesn't happen. 
A customer experience is really integrated into the value chain of the business. The, there has to be some re-engineering of the business processes. The information technology and the database is outdated and effective. Of course. You know, and that's why it's a can of worms. As soon as you start to do e-business, e-commerce, e-booking, uh, whatever, you know, you have opened that can of worms. You cannot hide because the customer expectation goes, uh, goes very high and they expect you to be up to date, to be accurate, to be flexible, to be responsive. All of those words that we use of quality, they have to be there. Otherwise, they move out and the mind also is shut down as far, in so far as the relationship is concerned. Maybe 24% uh, of the survey says that the leadership does not focus on customer experience. Of course, it's not born by itself. It has to be driven from top management. It has to be clearly articulated in the vision, in the mission, in the strategies and everything else. And the right employees are not there, 23%. So who's going to give you that experience if you don't have the right people? You know, as I said, at Heathrow Terminal 5, I mean, there are no staff. The British Airways staff have disappeared a long time ago because the cost, uh, uh, the cost drivers uh, have, have really been the obsession. They shrink and shrink and shrink an organization and remove all the flesh from the bone. And when they have a big crisis like this, there are no confident, competent people at the front who can actually deal with crisis. I was watching them and I really documented in my head a little case study of crisis management. They didn't even know how to organize queues. They didn't know how to sort the passengers. Some of them were crying out, you know, their flights were, you know, leaving in two minutes time. And they were queuing up with people who had three hours to kill. You know, it's just, just you know, completely, completely collapsed because of these reasons. And the interactability of the customer is very important. Remember what I said in my first slide, I said the one-to-one. -one. e commerce in business, they want, to, they want different channels. They want to talk to you via different means and method. And some organizations look at customer ex experience as a too costly thing to justify. You know, we cannot give the customer luxury. It will affect our business negatively. Well, um, Dr. Deming used to say, survival is not compulsory. You know, if you want to die, then keep, uh, keep doing it that way. So uh, these are the top 15 airlines in the, in the world, and none of them are good. Big does not mean best, unfortunately. And you have seen it uh, because they, none of them are ranked in the top 100 brands in the world. None of them are capable of giving us consistent, reliable, enjoyable uh, uh, experience uh, um, and every one of them if you like is surrounded with crisis with headlines and with letting down their customers they, you know so however some airlines come close and I just want to talk to you a little bit about the case study of Singapore International Airlines because they are truly trying to be customer centric they are not in the top 15 in the world but they are good enough to be mentioned tonight. So what makes them special? They have 10 ingredients of quality excellence. And I'll just briefly cover each one of those. Remember what I said about customer centricity? It has to be defined right at the top. It must be defined right at the top. Customer centricity about experience. Who gives you the experience? It's people. As you will see throughout the case study, it's all people, it's all competence, it's all professionalism, it's all about teamwork. And all of those investments are paying off. They are consistent. I've taken so many flights with Singapore International Airlines. They are very consistent. You cannot fault them. And when they blip, they recover the service with the speed of light. And they recover it with a smile. You know, they are not hesitant or embarrassed to apologize to you and to rectify whatever mistakes they make. I, I happened recently to share a platform with their vice president, customer service. We were both keynote speakers. It was amazing as to what they will do. And I will show you some pictures tonight, what they will do for their customers in the future. So let's look a little bit at each one of those. What does clarity and commitment mean? It means that the mission statement and the values are articulated in such a way 
that quality of service, the customer becomes the fundamental objective and aspiration of the airline. That is, that is the starting point. If you don't articulate it clearly and drive it from the top, why would you expect it to manifest itself at the bottom? So clarity of purpose means clarity of how important the customer is and making sure that it's driven from the top. Continuous training, and they have so many different opportunities, so many methods, on the job, classroom, uh, simulations, I mean like the way they train their pilots, the way they train the crew, you know, they have these cabins where they actually train them, so, uh, so they, they, they simulate what goes on in a cabin at 35,000 feet in the air. And they are all motivated to grow in terms of their talent, in terms of uh, their knowledge, and to improve their performance. It's very, very competitive to get a job in Singapore International Airlines because of the reputation of the airline and because of how good the employer is. And career development, most airlines, by the way, have high turnover, particularly with crew. The crew, on average, they stay 18 months, 16 months. And they are the people who really know most about the customer. If you think about it, who spends most time with the customer? It's the crew, when we fly. They're the ones who feed us, they put us to sleep, you know, and, and they, they run to help us put our bags up, in the, in the, you know, and, and yet that cumulative experience is dissipated. So when they land, when they say, I've had enough from flying up there, you know, give me a job on the ground, we, we, you know, the clever thing to do is say, ah, my best people, put them at the front. They know how the customer works. They have developed relationship. We get rid of them. Bring a new crew, train them, put them up. 16 months, next, like a sausage machine. So there's no career development, there's no opportunities. Singapore International Airlines don't lose. The retention rate is 10 years. The average retention rate is 10 years. They have seniors, you know. They have interacted with hundreds of thousands of customers. They mentor others. And the career development opportunities are there and they pick the best, the high flyers, and they give them the opportunity to learn and grow. So they maintain the value, they maintain the balance of service, of consistency, of reassurance, of trust, of pleasantry, pleasantness, of experiential obsession, of those kind of values. British Airways used to have them. Believe me, you know, British Airways at some point was a wonderful airline, you know, to fly with. They've lost it completely, you know. I mean, if you have flown BA recently and you haven't flown them for a while, you will know precisely what I mean. Internal communication means that you keep people informed, you keep reminding the people of how important the customer is. They have departmental newsletters, they have dialogue sessions between management and staff to say, this is where we're going to go, this is what we're going to change, this is what we're going to add. They have a staff idea suggestion scheme and they have prices, they honor the prize winners in big uh, ceremonies, um, and, uh, you know, and they have the proper governance meetings like the semi-annual business meetings so that people feel that the company is not losing track. There is no red alarms, the customer is still important, the top management keep reinforcing that point, and it keeps going, it keeps moving. And of course, externally, what is the message? The message is clear, no bums on seats, no cost cutting, not losing our luggage, not minimizing basically the number of complaints, delivering quality of service. That's what the customer wants to hear and that's what the Singapore International Airline sends out through its communications. And they do it with style, they do it very, very well. Connection with the customer, you know, different methods of evaluating, getting feedback, getting intelligence, the surveys, of course, that's the bare minimum. They have customer focus groups, giving them ideas about service, about reconfiguration of the cabin, about the brand, about the design. Um, they have a whole process. Lots of people write to them with compliments. You know, if you enjoy your flight and you've had a unique experience and some crew members were, you know, very helpful to you, you know, 
you would feel obliged to write a letter and at least praise them. So they have a rapid reply system to say thank you for giving us the thank you. But also if you have a complaint, they have a system of acknowledging it, of investigating it, coming back to you with service level agreements. And they have a service performance index on different attributes of quality. So that keeps them on track with customer centric uh, behaviors and attitudes. Where do you get ideas from? Benchmarking. So all the time they are searching for new innovations. They're tracking their competitors very closely. They don't just look at the airline. They look at uh, hotels and hospitality. They look at um, um, you know, the automobile sector with the showrooms. Um, and they look at banks. Uh, you know, and they basically bring ideas and um, implement new innovations to be fresh, to be new, uh, and to surprise the customer. Because the customer who is regular needs to see some kind of injection of newness. That's reassurance. That's really keep the trust very high. But if you come stale and the customer reads you mind and reads the way you provide your service, they know probably uh, you're becoming boring. And that's not a good thing to have. Of course, they have three I's, the improvement, the investment, and the innovation, which means that, like 3M, they have a culture of try it out, make it work, and see it through. In other words, they are not afraid to experiment. When something doesn't work out, they will withdraw it, but they will say, what were the lessons learned? What can we do next time in order not to have this problem? But if it works, they will not scale it up until they are absolutely certain, and then they see it through by uh, spreading it out throughout all the flights, throughout the whole operation. Read what that bottom statement says. Every possible effort is made to find the key to success or create it. That obsession with success, which in their terms is customer satisfaction, uh, customer delight, customer loyalty, means that it's priceless. You know, money is not the issue. The issue is re retention rate and the brand effect, because when you have a brand which is amongst the best, why lose it? And of course, because we are talking about the people industry, you know, you have to have a good reward scheme, recognition to all the staff. Um, and I've seen it myself in, in a variety of forms that they do it. Uh, the, you know, the pay, of course, position, but it's all about superior service which is recognized. You know, it's really people who go the extra mile, people who really believe in the customer, uh, and people who do not compromise quality that get rewarded. And the last thing are the, the, the three Ps. The three Ps are long term and short term. A staff culture vigorously committed to the airline. You don't want to lose your good people because British Airways have done that. They've lost good people because they're the ones who drive the improvement and they drive the customer satisfaction. Getting engagement and empowerment, you know, service recovery. Every day there are thousands of things that go wrong in the airline. Every day. But if you have a person who has got a computer in their head because they have seen it happen so many times, as soon as the, the blip happens, they will switch that computer on and they will know precisely how to recover the service. Maybe it's just a smile and, a, and, and, and a, an apologetic statement. Maybe it's really a crisis you run if you spill hot coffee on somebody's lap. It means, you know, go and get the towels first and make sure that person is not hurting bad. And then, you know, so it's, it's, it, is, it is really that experience. It's really that pride of having the best people working for you. And they're saying the profit for us as Singapore International Airlines is the applause we receive from providing consistent quality and service to our customers. That is customer centricity. I decided that instead of telling you the theory of uh, customer centricity, I will do it by taking you through a case study. And you can take those 10, basically, uh, factors of customer centricity with, uh, within Singapore International Airlines. And you can simulate the, the experience in your own organizations. So how do we build, therefore, a customer-centric mentality? Gazing into the future, we want to build durable, delightful, diligent, delicate, uh, dedicated service excellence where we can wow the customer. 
Number one is value innovation, which means that if we put the customer as a driving seat, we have to look at the um, absoluteness and the moving target insofar as customer expectation requirements is. In other words, we need to look at innovation not as a push thing like we did with products and services. We push stuff out. Here's a new printer. Here's a new way of managing your bank account. You know, here's a new car. But it's putting the customer in the driving seat by saying, what, what new things do you want? What new variations have you got in your head? In other words, instead of just fulfillment through the push mentality, why not drive value innovation through evoking emotion? Because the emotional thing is a personal thing. It's like somebody who cries and somebody who has never cried. Somebody who finds it easy to laugh and somebody who finds it hard to laugh. We cannot just tickle persons and say, ah, he's laughed, you know? Well, <laughs> and voluntarily he's laughed, but maybe inside he's crying, okay? So evoking the emotion of the customer is uh, redefining innovation in the 21st century. And the only way to do it is by putting them in the driving seat. Because for me only is a big statement, but it's one that is made possible. So in a sense, I am suggesting that we put the customer as the PLC, public limited company. In a sense, what I'm suggesting is that we put in front of the customer options and we say, you know, you are, you are the boss. I am your supplier. What do you want to do with them? You configure your service. You decide uh, when you are on a flight, you know, whether you want to fall asleep, whether you want to have a shower, whether you want to eat when everybody else is uh, enjoying their sleep. You know, I, I only put options in front of you. That's powerful if you can do that. The internet has allowed us to do this. Look, some of you here who are avid music uh, listeners, you can create your own CDs, right? And you think it's routine now. But think about how wonderful this innovation is. You create your own CDs that you put in your car when you're driving. Nobody else has got that mix of music except yourself. You go to shop and buy the books from Amazon. You choose your own books, your own mix. Nobody else has got what you have in your basket when you leave. You can buy your own vitamins before they put them in bottles and send them to you. And nobody else has got those mix of vitamins, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The internet has liberated uh, innovativeness. It has created true customer centricity because it has put the customer PLC mentality. And it's going to be even more the case. Learning. You will be able in the future to have your own degree. The only bad news for you guys is you still have to pass exams. But imagine the power of this. You can decide, you say, I'm tired. It's 6 p.m. I've had a long day. I don't want to enter the classroom now. I will do it at 6 a.m. in the morning. And guess what? You can get up at 6 a.m. and you click and through the virtual learning platform, you can enter the classroom and with a little bit of luck, there might be a DVD or video and they say, oh, he's addressing me. He's only talking to me only. It's wonderful, isn't it? You can study when you want, how you want, how fast you want to finish and consume that knowledge because guess what? PLC, public limited company, you have got the muscle and you've got the ability to influence you know, how you want to consume the experience. So I come back to this emotional, the uh, evoking emotions, the, what we call the law of heart. Yes, of course, rational thought leads customers to be interested, you know, because I'm hungry, I need to eat. Here's a restaurant, it smells nice. I'll go and sit down and eat, right? Um, I look at the car sitting there and say, oh, wouldn't it be nice to drive it? And, you know, so you start to visualize driving, if you like, uh, 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 you know, a sports car, uh, uh, you know, in, in a beautiful countryside, or whatever. But the real thing that sells nowadays is the emotion. It's not the attributes. It's not the functionality. It's whether the product suits me as my personality, whether it reflects my values, what I want. So people, people wear swatches, uh, swatch watches because it gives them personality. They wear branded goods because it's personality. They have a specific haircut because of the personality. They express their emotions through brands 
but also because it's for me only. It's, it builds the personality. And that, so the stuff that we used to teach, which is about productivity, innovation, impact, and everything else, does not disappear. I am saying it falls down to a lower level. It becomes baseline. It becomes predictable. It becomes demanded. But the, the, the stuff above that is really for, the, for me only. And that's non-negotiable. And that's why the quote of uh, Gandhi is an accurate one. You cannot compromise all those things. So let's just now start to uh, summarize. Um, the airline is a wonderful industry. I mean, I want to show you basically how difficult it is in a way for the airline to innovate, um, if you like, without changing radically the whole industry. A lot of innovation, um, which is radical, is happening within the aircraft itself, the design of the aircraft. Because the industry has woken up to the fact that we are not bombs and seats, you know. They can, the bosses of the airline, they can, they can say that, but we're all customers, we're all passengers. We're not sheep, you know. When we fly, we want value for money. Even if you pay the cheapest ticket, and it happens to be Ryanair, you know, you want to be treated as a human being. So value for money means a lot. Convenience, we want to fly when we want to fly. We want to fly, uh, basically, uh, and we want the flights to be available for us. Comfort is important to us, you know, because it's health. Comfort means, you know, I breathe fresh air. I have enough room for me to walk. I can stretch my legs, you know. If I'm a long flight, I can recline my seat at least a little bit, at least a little bit so I can sleep. I mean, for God's sake, you know, I mean, you know, th th this is realization. This is the 21st century. If the airline cannot get its act together, then we have the problem. But to be fair to the airline, of course they are reacting, and these pictures are an indication of this. And care means that don't throw the meal on my lap. Don't voice your frustration on me. Don't treat me, you know, as if I don't exist. These are all quality attributes. They are things that the customer expects. They are things that show that we are working towards customer centricity. And, you know, how do we wow your premium customers, basically, for customer-centric behaviors? All the behaviors that meet the basic products and service needs need, um, uh, you know, need to be taken care of. All the transactional needs need to be taken care of, but also all the emotional needs of customers so that the, the organization can exceed all of its goals. So it's functionality, it's service, and it's emotion, experience. You cannot deliver a unique experience if you have blipped with the basics. The foundation is weak. How can you expect this beautiful house to stand up? No way. So the functionality is taken for granted. It is quality, but it has come down. The service that you used to praise, luggage arriving on time, departure on time, checking in on time, pleasantry from the staff who book you in, uh, assistance in the airports, whatever, 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 that has come down. The only thing now that remains is evoking the emotions, getting you to uh, replenish those beautiful uh, reactions which are about praise, uh, pra praisefulness, and which are about satisfaction, which are about undertaking a further commitment to loyalty and uh, retention. Those are the things that really we can uh, grab. But you can only do those if you excel at the others. So this is really what Singapore International Airline is doing, providing unique experiences, giving you a seven-star hotel experience. So if you are a premium customer, and you're flying long haul, you know, you can go to your bedroom, you can sleep, you can have a shower, you know, you, may, you might decide, um, you know, to, uh, to watch movies, you can watch them basically in total comfort. Even if you look at the, what we used to call economy, uh, economy seat, the economy seat has abundant leg room, it has a bigger screen, so you are entertained, you are made to feel important, not bums on seat, but a valuable customer. You have got computers, and you are still an economy class passenger. So it's a relative statement, because the experience for me only, if I have the money, uh, uh, then I can enjoy more luxury. 
but if I don't have the money, I can still enjoy luxury, albeit defined at the lower level, because um, you know basically uh, uh, affordability becomes uh, a differentiating factor between uh, different customer uh, uh, segments. So uh, let me just leave you with some thoughts now. Southwest Airline, they say, we're not an airline with great customer service. We're a great customer service organization that happens to be in the airline business. I actually like that. I think it's a good uh, statement. And if many organizations start that way around, instead of the push thing, then they start to pull and create the customer PLC attitude, they will be more likely to be successful than they are doing at the moment. Starbucks, we are in the coffee business serving people. We're not, sorry, in the coffee business serving people. We are in the people business serving coffee. I mean, I agree with that. I think <coughs> unless you don't like Starbucks and you are a Costa kind of addict, th they are meeting places, those places. They are places for chilling out. They are places for catching up on your emails. They are places for doing many other things. But they are places where you like the smell of coffee, you like your bean, you like your drug, you like, you know? So um, the experience thing does not need to be expensive. You can just have had a bad day, a horrible day, you go to your local Starbucks and you sit there and, you know, and you just, you know, fills you up positively and you feel, you know, that. So, uh, you know, I think that's something to bear in mind. That, you know, we're not talking about expensive. Now, just to finish, Models. We like models. We like giving you big ideas. What is a customer experience management roadmap? And uh, what are we talking about in terms of creating a momentum of customer centricity that delivers uh, value to the customer but delivers loyalty and retention to the organization? Um, I have four building blocks that I want to share with you. And then I have the the, the, the soft thing that are created by managing these four building blocks. Uh, one of them is creating the impression, and the other one is the experiential expression, the outcome of uh, going through a unique experience. The first one, the emotional experience design. It means that we don't design engineering. We don't design functionality. We don't design basically with structures, with, with paper. We design with the emotional input first. So that means there are new methods and tools that we can use. They are generative and evaluative, basically needs and expression at the same time. So um, uh, for example, there is something called uh, uh, CJM, customer journey mapping. You look at actually the whole experience of the customer in a computer-based uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, package, and then you evaluate exactly how to uh, create that design. Make the design as real as possible because it, it is emotional. It is not fulfilling through functionality. And the best way to evoke emotions is to focus on the five senses. Interactivity, customer value, personal meaning, and uh, uh, all in that uh, context of emotional context. Uh, this is a big field. and It's not my area of expertise. But it is happening more and more. Uh, and uh, uh, computer-based packages are allowing us basically now to simulate. I mean, for example, this is not a new technology. I remember Levi's many years ago, they said, we can fill your wardrobe for you without you having the hassle to go to shopping malls. Because years ago, you see, if you wanted to buy a pair of jeans, you would have had to go there and hope that uh, you, haven't, you haven't had too many burgers or something. And then they throw you in these tiny little changing, changing cubicles, you know, with a lot of sweat, the lighting, and everything else. And you try to find a pair that fits you. Nowadays, you don't have to do that because they, they will measure you. Uh, they will show you rotating left, right, and right, left, uh, the 3D uh, uh, model. And then when you are happy with the shape you look, uh, they will send the data, and they prepare you a pair of jeans, and they deliver it to your doorsteps without a penny more, at 34 uh, pounds, 99 pence. Is that correct? Or have they gone up recently? So that is, that is a way of using, basically, technology to look at the emotional reaction. Because the for me only means that you know, you, you, the customer 
decides. I decide what color. I decide what kind of fabric. I might have an allergy, so I cannot have some fabrics. I, need, I only can have some others. And that choice, that ability to basically decide what you want to happen to you is the only uh, chance to have uh, emotional reactions. Having a customer-centric strategy is very important. What is your ability to create in individual experiences through customizing, mass customization? In other words, from customization to customization. Not many organizations are ready. I'm sorry, I did show you the graphs. I did show you the percentages. You know, it's a can of worms. As soon as you open that, you know, either you survive or you die. And we need to have the customer life cycle approach by redefining the value chain. The measurement points need to be clearly defined at upstream at the design side, downstream at the delivery side, and then you keep reiterating the cycle of that uh, strategy. Uh, you need to have a different method of evaluating quality. I called it total equality management based on the seven S's model, what we believe in, how we relate to our marketing key stakeholders, what are our focus, how we manage the value chain, what do we do and provide the expressions we hope we can recreate, the sensations. Uh, S for staunchness means the loyalty and the attachment of our customers. So this is a redefinition of what the seven S's are. And the CRM is important, but the CRM is the left brain of the organization. The analytics, the data basically is important because how do you know uh, um, that you know, customer A is different from customer B if you have got a database of 35 million of them. So you need the analytics. You need to profile your customers. You need to build the intelligence. And that's important. And I said the impression and the expression. You have to create an impression in the eyes and minds of the customer through excellence at all points of contact. And then you will generate an expression of delight and the emotional response from the customer. Now, how many of you are doing marketing as a measure here? Right. I'm not going to criticize the marketeers. The marketeers are romantic fools, you know. They are creative. <laughs> they tickle you and they, 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 you know, they talk about the brand and uh, they create the wow. But on the ground, if you don't have the foundation, you know, then you cannot create brand attachment. The brand attachment is based on the pyramid effect. So you need to have excellence as a foundation and then you can generate the expression through the emotional attachment to the brand. I just wanted to tease somebody from marketing. <laughs> Next time I will tease somebody from uh, supply chain or whatever. <laughs>